Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Fact Set Second Quarter Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference to your speaker today, Rima Haider, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Joelle. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Welcome to FactSet's second fiscal quarter 2021 earnings call. We will we continue to be in various remote locations today. Um, we may have some audio quality issues, and we really appreciate your patience should we experience a disruption. Before we begin, I would like to point out that the slides we will reference during this presentation can be accessed via the webcast on the Investor Relations section of our website at factset.com. The slides will be posted on our website at the conclusion of this call. A replay of today's call will be available via phone and on our website. After our prepared remarks, we will open the call to questions from investors. To be fair to everyone, please limit yourself to one question plus one follow-up. Before we discuss our results, I encourage all listeners to review the legal notice on slide two, which explains the risks of forward-looking statements and the use of non-GAAP financial measures. Additionally, please refer to our forms 10-K and 10-Q for a discussion of risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from these forward-looking statements. Our slide presentation and discussions on this call will include certain non-GAAP financial measures. For such measures, reconciliation of the most directly comparable GAAP measures are in the appendix to the presentation and in our earnings release issued earlier today. Joining me today are Phil Snow, Chief Executive Officer, and Helen Shan, Chief Financial Officer. I'd now like to turn the discussion over to Phil Snow. Thanks, Rima, and good morning, everyone. I'm pleased with our solid second quarter and overall first half results and the investments we've made to further advance our offerings in both content and workflow solutions are resonating. Over the past 12 months, we've proven our resilience and our ability to strengthen our value to clients, and we begin the second half of this fiscal year with good momentum, greater visibility, and continued confidence in our ability to execute. Our investments in content and technology are progressing at pace, and we see market validation of our strategy with some key wins this quarter. Our content advances, particularly in deep sector, are being well received by clients, especially across the sell side, supporting workstation growth. And our focus on digital transformation allows us to offer more personalized solutions and an increasing number of ways to deliver value to clients. The market is looking for solutions that are both easy to integrate and unite the front, middle, and back office, and we are well positioned to capitalize on this trend. Our shift to the public cloud is progressing according to plan, with the majority of our news storage and collection centers successfully migrated. This quarter, we are particularly pleased to see growth in our core workstation offering. The efforts we've made through our investment strategy are starting to drive our top line and we delivered a strong first half due to our ability to execute on our pipeline with continued discipline. In our second quarter, our organic ASV plus professional services growth rate accelerated to 5.5%. This acceleration was led by our sales team effectively growing wallet share with existing clients as well as capturing a higher price increase in the Americas. This was partially offset by cancellations largely across asset management firms. We're pleased that our performance resulted in increased adjusted operating margin on EPS, and we have good momentum going into our second half. We reaffirm our ability to deliver results within our guidance for fiscal 21 and are raising the lower end of our full-year organic ASV growth range to $70 million from $55 million. Helen will explain in more detail shortly. Turning now to the performance in our regions, the Americas growth accelerated to 6%, driven by strong sales of workstations in research and wealth solutions and data feeds in CTS solutions. Our research solutions had a particularly good quarter, supported by our digital transformation, 
and the expansion of our deep sector content offering. This was evident from wins with our large existing banking clients who benefited from our tailored workflows, which allow them a more connected and personalized experience. CTS also had a successful quarter as clients bought more of our core and premium data feeds. And in wealth, we're extremely pleased with the RBC win. This was an entirely virtual rollout, and I'm proud of how quickly and seamlessly our team integrated our advisor dashboard workflow and CRM solutions for RBC's entire wealth management team. Asia-Pac accelerated its growth rate to 9% due to the strong performance in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. We saw wins at institutional asset managers and data providers with our research and CTS solutions. EMEA's growth remained at 4% with wins across the region, most notably in France and the Nordics. The region benefited from increased sales of CTS and wealth solutions to asset owners and institutional asset managers, as well as accelerating new business. Our diversifying client base continues to seek mission-critical data, and we see strong demand for our growing content offering. We're pleased with the progress we are making in the ESG market as we further integrate our ESG products into clients' everyday workflows. We've already expanded our ESG content suite with the launch of True Value's UN Sustainable Development Goals Monitor. This is in addition to a new joint offering with Ping On Insurance Group, which offers ESG metrics on companies incorporated in mainland China. Overall, we see a long runway for growth as we execute more enterprise-wide deals and believe that every touch point with clients today represents an opportunity to cross-sell in the future. The conversations we are having combined with our sales team's execution make us optimistic that we will continue to grow our market share long term. In summary, our focus continues to be on achieving higher growth and providing clients with effective and efficient solutions across the entire investment workflow. We remain committed to our investment strategy and to living our purpose, which is to drive the investment community to see more, think bigger, and do their best work. And we are starting to see the rewards of the efforts we are making. We continue to push ourselves to be a more diverse, inclusive, and impactful organization. To that end, I'm pleased to say we recently hired our first Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer as part of our strategy to strengthen our organizational accountability, increase diversity across all levels of our company, and ensure workforce equity. We know we have more work to do and remain committed to furthering our efforts. I'm pleased with our progress as we strive to be the best place to work and give our employees the flexibility they need to thrive in the new normal. I'm proud of the ways in which we are showing up for one another and for our clients every day. With that, I'll now turn things over to Helen, who will take you through the specifics of our second quarter and first half 2021 performance. Thank you, Phil, and hello, everyone. I hope that you and your loved ones continue to be safe and healthy. I am proud of the fact that team for finding new ways this past year to support both our clients and each other. Today, I will share more details on our performance to date and to provide an update to our annual outlook. For the first half of fiscal 2021, we grew our revenue by 6%, expanded our adjusted operating margin by 60 basis points, and increased our adjusted EPS by 9% year over year. Our multi-year investment plan is on track and beginning to materialize in top-line growth. Last quarter, we welcomed True Value Labs to FactSet. I am pleased to report that the integration of the team and of the ESG and technology assets is largely complete. As with our previous acquisitions, we will exclude any revenue and ASP associated with TVL while we're reporting out on organic-related metrics for the fiscal year of 2021. As Phil stated earlier, we grew organic ASV plus professional services at 5.5%, an acceleration from the first quarter that reflects the diligent execution of our pipeline powered by healthy demand for workstations and data feeds. Ongoing investments in our core solutions continue to resonate with clients, as reflected in our annual Meritas price increase, which totaled $14 million two million more than the prior year. As of previous years, our annual price increase is a contributor to ASV, and again this year, further accelerating our growth rate. 
For the second quarter, gas revenue increased by 6% to $392 million, while organic revenue, which excludes any impact on foreign exchange acquisition and the third revenue organization, increased 5% to $389 million. Growth was driven primarily by our analytics and CTS solutions. For our geographic segments, revenue growth for the Americas is about 7%, EMEA at 3%, and Asia Pacific at 10%. All regions primarily benefited from increases in our analytics and CPS solutions. GAP operating expenses grew 5% in the second quarter to $276 million, impacted by a higher cost of sales. Compared to the previous year, our GAP operating margin expanded by 90 basis points to 30%, and our adjusted operating margin increased by 80 basis points. 33%. These improvements are largely due to net savings from continued productivity to a workforce mix and a reduction in discretionary expenses, including those related to travel, office, and professional services. These benefits will partially offset the higher spend in both compensation and technology. As a percentage of revenue, our cost of sales was 230 basis points higher than last year on a gap basis and 170 basis points higher on an adjusted basis. This increase is driven by higher technology spend related to our shift to the public cloud and increased compensation expense for existing employees as well as new talent to support a multi-year investment plan. When expressed as a percentage of revenue, SG&A improved year over year by 320 basis points on a GAAP basis and 250 basis points on an adjusted basis. The primary drivers include materially lower travel and entertainment costs and reduced spend due to office closures, offset in part by higher compensation costs. These results are in line with our expectations, as noted in our full year guidance. As discussed on previous calls, we plan for an incremental investment spend of $15 million each year, starting in 2020 through 2022. While realizing some benefits from productivity, and a delayed ramp up in hiring last year, we are on track to spend around $26 million in our fiscal FY21. As noted on last quarter's call, we're also using a portion of the pandemic savings to invest further in both sales and new product development. Moving on, our tax rate for the quarter was 16%, compared to last year's rate of 14% primarily due to lower tax benefits realized from stock option exercises this quarter. GAAP EPS increased 9% to $2.50 this quarter versus $2.30 in the prior year. The justly diluted EPS grew 7% at $2.72. Both EPS figures were largely driven by improved operating results, partially offset by a higher tax rate. The reconciliation of our adjustments to GAAP EPS is disclosed at the end of our press release. Free cash flow, which we define as cash generated from operations less capital spending, was $130 million for the quarter, an increase of 75% over the same period last year. This increase is primarily due to the timing of certain tax payments and lower capital expenditures, as we have completed the majority of our office build out. In the first quarter, our ASV retention continued to be above 95%. We grew our total number of clients by 7% compared to the prior year, reaching over 6,000 clients for the first time in our history. This growth reflects the addition of more wealth in corporate clients, as well as data providers and asset owners. An ongoing trend we have continued to, as we continue to diversify our client base. Our client retention improved to 90% year over year, which speaks both to the mission criticality of our solutions and the solid efforts of our sales teams. Our use of count of 12% year over year and cost a total of 150000 largely due to additional wealth and research workstation users. As noted in our press release this morning, we revised the methodology for how we define our users to capture more expansive set across all our solutions. We have provided revised user accounts for the last eight quarters at the end of the press release. For the second quarter, we have purchased over 221,000 shares of our common stock for a total of $72 million, an average share price of $322. Our 
Uh, Board of Directors recently authorized an additional $206 million to our insured purchase program, bringing the total size to $350 million in line with recent years. We remain disciplined in our buyback program and committed to returning long-term value to our shareholders. Given our solid first half performance and improved visibility for the rest of the year, we are bringing up the lower end of our organic ASV post-professional services growth guidance range from $55 million to $70 million. So our full range is now $70 to $85 million. This raises our midpoint from when what we set first set this guidance six months ago. Client demand for our enhanced solutions alongside the momentum built by our sales team gives us greater conviction in our second half pipeline. Based on the first half results, we are encouraged by the client response to our enhanced product suite reflected in both growth in new clients as well as increased expansion with existing clients. We do remain in an uncertain environment as different parts of the world begin to recover from this pandemic. A full year of views take into account that clients continue to perform in current market conditions and that additional delays in decision making and tightening client budgets could impact our short term performance. The global environment will continue to, prevent, to present challenges, but we believe we are well positioned for the longer term. With that, we're now ready for your questions. I'll turn this over to Joelle. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Manav Patnaik with Barclays. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, you know, early in the call, you talked about, you know, the move to public cloud is going well. And I just wanted to maybe take a step back and was hoping you could help us just appreciate, uh, you know, where FactSet today is in terms of its, you know, tech stack and how long do you think, you know, you get to, you know, where you want to be? Yeah, thanks, Manav. Um, yeah, when we... Um, published, you know, our three-year plan six quarters ago. Um, you know, we have a three-year window to get 80% into the public cloud, uh, which will just give us, I think, a lot of advantages in terms of speed and agility um, across, you know, how we develop products and how we deliver uh, product to our clients. So I'd say we're, you know, we're on pace. We're halfway through that journey. Uh, we're all already beginning to see a lot of the benefits uh, from uh, being in the public cloud. So that is a major piece of the move from a technology standpoint. I would say the second thing is opening up the platform. So uh, providing APIs to access facts set content and analytics, um, you know, whether or not you're a client and you want to uh, just program directly against our database or if you, you know, want to access it through um, some other means, uh, you know, through some other channel, we're making that available as well. And it should also make FactSet easier to integrate with other third-party systems. So that's another important uh, aspect of that. So overall, we're pleased. You know, I'd say we're halfway through that original plan. You know, we're a technology company, so of course that never ends. But we we are beginning to definitely see uh, some of the benefits of, of the work that we've been doing. Okay, got it. And then just on, uh, you know, True Value Labs and the ESG integration you talked about, uh, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to appreciate maybe better what the strategy there was or, you know, would True, or would True Value Labs be kind of like, you know, street account in many ways in terms of, you know, a good offering just integrated in your packages? Yeah, I would say it's a little different than street account. So we certainly um, have a fantastic product there that we can sell today as its own offering. Uh, that will continue. Uh, very often that's a feed uh, these days. Uh, however, we've done a lot of work already to integrate the True Value Labs data through uh, the fact set um, uh, workflows. So, you know, you know, I think we all sort of uh, recognize that ESG is very important and will be a piece of just about everybody's workflow in some way, shape, or form. So for us, making sure that you can access uh, ESG, um, you know, directly or as an overlay, whether you're a research analyst, you're a quant, 
Uh, maybe you want to look at your portfolios and group things a certain way or add in some metrics. We want to make sure that all of that's available through our platform. And one of the advantages, again, of using FactSet is you can uh, seamlessly stitch together all those workflows. So we've learned a lot in terms of integration, you know, during our um, lifetime. And uh, this has been one of the faster um, integrations of both the people and the technology and the content that I've seen. So we're well on our way. Uh, we're very optimistic about ESG as a theme. And, you know, we'll, we think we'll begin to see the benefits of that before too long. Got it. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tony Kaplan with Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Thank you. I wanted to ask about wealth and congratulations on the RBC win. Um, just in terms of the overall um, strategy and, and, and features there, I know you have the full-featured web-deployed version that you created about two years ago. You've won some significant contracts. Just, I guess, how are you tracking versus your expectations in wealth, and how much opportunity is left there, um, you know, just given that you've been sort of ramping up in wealth over the last few years? Thanks, Tony. Uh, we see a ton of opportunity in wealth. It's one of our fastest-growing, you know, firm types that we sell into. Uh, obviously, you know, these big wins are, are very important because, uh, I think it gets us more notice in the marketplace. And, you know, as advisors move around from uh, firm to firm over the years, I think they will get used to using FactSet as a, as a tool. So we think there's a ton of runway here. Um, we see that, you know, there are a lot of interesting trends going on in the wealth space. Uh, and today, you know, we own a small piece of the workflow. Um, you know, one thing that, we're excited about is our advisor dashboard product, which essentially um, helps an advisor think about what their next best action is. So we're beginning to in introduce uh, cognitive computing uh, to look at the client's portfolios and the news associated with the holdings they have uh, to really help them organize their day and so on. So we think that's uh, unique uh, and a good opportunity for us. Uh, and we just think that, you know, in terms of the wealth space, there are lots of other places over time uh, that we could begin to move into, um, you know, that, that would be a creative defense. That's great. And, and can you also just hone in on the sort of differentiators that you're offering? You know, are, are you winning more now because of the quality of the product or price or service? Um, you know, just trying to understand, um, you know, you, you have some momentum there. So wanted to, to get to the bottom yeah, of that. The, yeah, sure. On the product side, um, you know, we have very good search functionality. So it's very easy for an advisor to come into our wealth offering and find what it is they're looking for very quickly. That um, has been a big winner. Uh, and our web offering um, is seamless to navigate as well, just in, in terms of, of sort of navigating from screen to screen. The speed of the product um, is really good. So if you're an advisor and you're managing, you know, the assets of 200 families or individuals, uh, being able to kind of get around quickly is important. Uh, and service has been a big uh, piece of this, Tony. So um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, we were able to virtually roll out um, this offering to, uh, eight, I think, 8,000 advisors uh, really quickly. And in some ways, uh, doing it virtually was easier than, um, you know, what, how we might have done it uh, two years ago, which would be literally to fly around to almost every city we could to train people in person. So we've learned a lot about efficiency over the last year, and that's been a good experience on both sides. So I think it's uh, that classic fact, that combo of the product and the service that's really allowing us to win here, and it's the uh, investments that we've made in technology that I just spoke about that are allowing us to scale, upload more portfolios, um, and um, support more people than we might have been able to do on our old tech stack. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Hamza Mazari with Jeffries. Your line is now open. Uh, good morning. I uh, just had a question on uh, the, the ASV um, 
uh, acceleration. Is, is that all? I know you touched on the prepared comments with, with pricing, but is that all the RVC win in the ESV acceleration, or is, is there anything else in there? I know you touched on pricing, and then as part of that, uh, is there a reason why the low end of the revenue guide wasn't raised, but you did raise the ASV uh, guide on, uh, on on the low end? Um, yeah, sure. So let me um, – I'll, I'll try to answer both of those. And, Helen, please uh, chime in on the second one if um, there's more to be said. So, you know, in terms of the acceleration, Hamza, we're seeing very good um, performance from our research offering. So – the core workstation and core web offerings uh, are doing very well. So, yes, RBC was a really nice win, and a lot of the users you see there in terms of the increase were driven from that. But we're also doing exceptionally well, you know, with our large banking clients uh, in terms of renewals and the adoption um, of, you know, just more usage through our deep sector offerings. So that certainly has been a driver, and we've seen, um, I think, good uh, uplift in terms of um, the buy side as well in terms of the research offering. So I think it's that core fact set workstation uh, that is performing well in this environment given uh, the investments that we've made and some of the trends that are out there. So that's the, the main thing that I would attribute it to. Um, and revenue always takes a long time to catch up to ASV. So, you know, a lot of our, um, a lot of our ASV comes in the second half. Uh, and the amount of revenue that we capture from that, you know, um, isn't as much as we would from from stuff that we closed in in Q1. And you knew that in in the Q1 we were sort of minus seven there on the ASV side. No, that's that's exactly right. Uh, Hamza, thanks for thanks for your question. We are back in or back half loaded, and I would say even within the second half, uh, we typically have strong Q4. That doesn't reflect uh, or or turn into revenue necessarily in, in year. So that's why we did not change uh, our, um, our revenue guidance. That's uh, very helpful. And just my follow-up question um, is, is just uh, you had mentioned, you know, areas outside of wealth, um, you know, whether it be corporates, insurance, maybe private equity, maybe other areas. Uh, but do, do you have to invest more in sales or go to market to be able to penetrate some of those verticals or, you know, do you have enough capacity um, that, you know, you can penetrate those verticals with, with sort of the uh, headcount you have today? Yeah, we, uh, we, we can do it with the headcount we have today. Um, as I mentioned on the RBC win, you know, we were able to deploy uh, a large number of users very virtually. So I think what we're learning is that for um, – you know, for the non-enterprise-wide um, sales, um, sort of selling and supporting a client uh, for the core workstation uh, is something that we can do very efficiently. Uh, and we're beginning to explore new ways of how to double down on that in terms of how we can, um, you know, get more of those clients at the smaller end um, more efficiently so that we can focus the rest of our resources on the larger, more enterprise-wide deployments. Got it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Owen Lau with Oppenheimer. Your line is now open. Good morning, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, could you please talk about your recent traction in the asset owner space? Do you have the ESG products you'd like to further penetrate into this area? And what other products you think can help you increase your penetration? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, in the asset owner space, our analytics suite um, really plays a big part there. So very often uh, when we're working with asset owners, we'll be doing a risk deployment or we'll be doing um, portfolio analytics across either their internally managed or externally managed assets. So we're, we've done a lot of work, as you know, across the portfolio lifecycle, and we've done a lot of work to invest uh, in multi-asset class offerings. So we do have some good momentum, you know, across different types of asset owners, uh, and, it, and it's a space that we're increasingly optimistic about. Got it. And then, uh, and then, could you please also talk about your partnership with uh, with Ping An? Um, there are other ESG content providers in China. 
Uh, can you talk about what is the value proposition of One Connect uh, and also is its content uh, content exclusive to FactSet users? Thanks. Yeah, so we you know we um, have a good relationship with Ping On uh, in China, and uh, I think they've they've developed some very good ESG content, and we just we're we're a good channel partner for them. So I think where you'll see this show up. Uh, first of all, is in the open FactSet marketplace, and then we should have plans to integrate that into the FactSet offering for the workflows that our clients care about. And I'm, I'm not in a position to sort of uh, talk about whether or not it's an exclusive. All right. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kevin McVeigh with Credit Suisse. Your line is now open. Great, thanks so much. Hey, I wonder, can you give us a sense of where you are in, in, in the three-year investment? I mean, it sounds like you're making good progress on the cloud, but, you know, maybe just a little more context within kind of analytics, CTS, wealth. I mean, it sounds like on the research side, you're starting to see some benefit of that, but any sense of kind of benchmarks we should think about it as, as, as we continue the, the transition vis-a-vis the investments? Sure, I'll take a, a – thank you, Kevin, for the, the question. Let me take a shot at that. Sure. Um, Thanks, so Kevin. First, yeah, sure. So first, we've made some really solid progress, as we've discussed, and, and we're very confident in the strategy in moving forward on, on content and technology. Uh, and discussions that we've had over the 12, uh, past 12 months, if, if anything, has really only reaffirmed that the investments that uh, we're making is, is, is key f- for them. That's in, in content, digital transformation, and on the personalization front. So in terms of where we're beginning to see some of that, that impact, um, we're seeing that in our workstation growth. Um, we're going to talk a, a bit more. So the investments we're making in deep sector is really resonating with banking clients, for example. Um, and, in fact, some of the digital uh, improvements we've made has been part of one of the, the key wins in the availability, in availability uh, that they've got through the cloud and, and, and the integration there. Um, and then when you talk about CTS as well as and on, the, on the analytics front, um, we're seeing pickup in APIs, uh, in our signals and CRM APIs and concordance. And, uh, and then the benefit from the from the cost perspective, uh, some of the improvements we've made is helping us on the automation front, on content collection, for example. So those are what we look at as some of the, the real key deliverables that are beginning to come through this year and why we make um, the comment that the, that the impact is, is happening, as we expected, uh, and, uh, and we're going to continue through as we invest for the rest of the year on to 2022. And just real quick, it, it seems like you picked up about 100 basis points of client retention. Um, was that some of the actions you took as a result of COVID, or just any thoughts as to what's driving that retention improvement? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's probably a mix. I mean, that 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 number can move a little bit around, but it's you know, pretty stable at that that 90 percent. What we we tend to focus on um, more is on the uh, on the on the ASV retention as well. But it, it really is. Um, we've been able to do some of the good renewals. I think the, the points that Phil made earlier uh, on how we've been able to continue to service folks very well, the faster implementation that we've done on our new products, it's probably been the expansion that has really resonated. Uh, so I think those are all those reasons on why we've been able to maintain, if not improve, our client retention. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alex Cram with UBS. Your line is now open. Yeah, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, just coming back to the earlier question on ASV outlook and what changed there, it sounded to me like you said you're you're more confident in some of those deals coming through, but can you talk about the pipeline as well? Has the pipeline grown? And and given some of the wins that you've had so far this year, like what, what, what was missing to, to maybe uh, get a little bit more aggressive on the high end of the range as well. Hey, Alex. Um, yeah, we're, we're very happy with the pipeline for the second half. So we do have a healthy pipeline. Um, I would say, you know, for us to – and we certainly have a pipeline that could support the top end uh, of our range. So the things that I think would need to go right there would be, um, you know, there's 
the banking uh, hiring uh, in Q4. That's always a big variable for us. So I think if the banks are uh, having good hiring this year, that bodes well for us, just sort of given about some of the trends we already talked about on the sell side. Uh, we're optimistic that we'll be able to execute on our Q3 price increase uh, in EMEA and Asia PAC, which uh, comes after the Q2 price increase in the Americas. Uh, you know, the one area of our business that slowed a little bit is analytics. Um, it has, I think, the, you know, the highest uh, absolute ASV contribution in most years. And, you know, what's happening there, I believe, is that because of the COVID environment, these longer sales cycle, more complicated uh, implementations uh, are taking a little bit longer. Um, the analytics pipeline is very healthy. It's comparable to last year. So if we're able to execute on that well, you know, I'm optimistic about what that means in terms of uh, ASV for the full year. Okay, great. And then just maybe, Helen, for you, can you give us an update on, on the margin trajectory here? I mean, I think you had a fairly good start to the year. I think you had said before that the margins would trickle down lower, but I think given what you've done so far and you, you didn't change anything about the guidance there, it still uh, suggests a decent step down in the second half. So maybe just Refresh us on, on where that's coming from um, and, uh, and, and if there could be any, any, uh, any upside to, to what you've currently laid out. Thanks. Sure, we'll, we'll do. And th thanks for the, the question. I'll touch a bit on Q2 and then talk about H2, which, uh, which, which will uh, be more of the same, so it might be helpful. So we've been um, very pleased with the improvements that we've driven year over year as it relates to the operating results. Uh, part of that is uh, clearly due to higher revenue as well. But if we think about the uptick uh, on the costs, it reflects in a couple of different ways. The increased investments that we've made in our deep sector content collection, uh, digital capabilities, those are coming through in higher salary and technology costs. Uh, we also have made additional hiring in sales and product uh, development. Uh, as we talked about last quarter, that's, and that's reflected in the 8% growth in our headcount year, year over year. In terms of um, a headwind that we, we had this quarter that was a bit on FX, which impacted our, our, our margin um, about 30, 35 basis points. And then offsetting all of that uh, is the continued efficiencies that we're getting through the workforce mix. We, we uh, moved shift again to, to lower cost uh, countries by another one percent. Um, we've had reduced professional fees this quarter, services costs this quarter. We do expect that to pick back up in the second half, so that might be that is more of a timing issue. Uh, and of course, we're getting the benefit of uh, of being out of the office and T and E. Although after this quarter, we're going to start to to lap the, the, the previous uh, previous year. So when we think about the second half, you're exactly right, Alex. We do expect costs to uh, to ramp up further. Um, and that's in, in part driven by uh, the investment plan for sure. Uh, as I mentioned in our, my remarks, um, we, are, we believe we'll have around $26 million of costs related to our investment plan this year versus, uh, versus, versus more like 15 last year. Uh, and we're seeing that salary run rate start to really pick up. And a lot of the investments that we're needing are more specialized, so they tend to be in the more higher cost countries. So we, we see that pick up. Professional fees, we believe, as we, uh, we're employing others to help us on the execution and implementation front that's going to pick up. And we're still having the double carrying costs between the cloud and, and, the, and the data centers. And then we also have the full absorption of the uh, dilution from, from, from the TVL acquisition uh, as well. Um, you know, we, we will see when, what kind of costs we'll have to have as relates to the uh, the uh, offices hopefully reopening um, as business starts to get closer to whatever that level of normal is, so that could be an offset. And we uh, continue to be focused, of course, on managing the spend um, and, uh, and, and any discretionary costs that we have. So we will um, be focused on, on driving that as we have over the past uh, two and a half years. Great, Carla. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Chu with Bank of America. Your line is now open. Hi. Uh, thanks. So subscriber count was up roughly like 6,700 in the versus the first quarter, and I think RBC brought over about 8,000 users. So just wondering if user count fell on a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis on an underlying basis X to RBC users? Sure. 
sorry, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll take a shot at that one. Thanks for thanks for your question. So the the total number of subscribers, I think what we, we talked about is how we we have re um, captured in, in some case of that. Yes, RBC is a, a, a piece of that or a big piece of that, but overall uh, user counts were uh, were up, subscribers were were up um, in both wealth and corporate. So that is uh, that and corporate. Uh, while they are small in number in terms of each firm, there's been quite a few of them. So both of them are driving the increase on the subscriber side. Okay. And then if I can focus on margins more broadly over like the next few years. So just given the recent strong performance and it feels like an increased focus on cost since Helen, you've been there taking over as CFO. Just wondering if there's any reason you can't get above the historical 33 to 34% range. Just wondering if there's anything structurally that would suggest that that's the long-term range go forward. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't, as you, as you know, we don't necessarily talk about our long-term margin. Right now, if you take a look at our history, uh, especially back where we were able to do a pretty material expansion in our margins, um, we took the opportunity to reinvest, and reinvesting is what we're doing in 20 as well as in, in, in 21. Part of the drivers of margin, uh, as you as you know, will be top line growth, and that's exactly what we're doing. So I don't look at what we have as a structural issue uh, as much as we're investing, and as we get the top line to grow, given the benefits that we're providing for that for our clients, um, we would expect our margins to be, you know improving um, as, uh, as we continue to drive more of the top-line growth. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Our next question comes from Shlomo Rosenbaum with Stiefel. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Hey, uh, Phil and Helen, I thought I would just uh, circle back to the one of the questions you touched on before, just in terms of the validation of moving to the cloud. Uh, I apologize if I missed this, but were there specific uh, examples of products or, or something like that that you're you're seeing, uh, you know, the uptake in sales on or, or new products that were generated because you were moving to the cloud that gave you the, you know, faster uh, product development that you're able to point to in terms of that validation? If you can, uh, you know, uh, talk about that a little bit, and then I'll have a follow-up after that. Sure. Thanks, Shlomo. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I mentioned in my comments was moving our content collection efforts to the cloud. So we've been working on um, sort of refactoring how we collect content and how we store content so that we can onboard content uh, more quickly. So when you talk about deep sector, private markets, uh, very often these data sets can be orders of magnitude more than we've been used to collecting in the past. So that was a very important uh, piece of work that we've been undergoing. So we're beginning to see some of the benefits of that. Uh, more will come later, I believe, on both the product uh, and the cost side as we, as we complete that work. So that's one good example. The, you know, the APIs uh, and the endpoints that we're setting up, uh, those are also um, getting some pretty good adoption, particularly in analytics. So that's a great example. And then I think when you consider some of the work we're doing with firms like Snowflake, for example, uh, where we're able to sort of work with them uh, and provide our data feeds and our concordance as a service, all, all of this is wrapped up into our digital transformation efforts. So there, you know, there's a lot of foundational work here, a lot of cost associated with moving, uh, but there, are, but you know, the the real payoff will come uh, when the work is completed uh, over the next year or two. Okay, thank you. And then just the European organic growth at 1.5%, is that kind of a legacy thing from some of the uh, uh, the client cancellations in a, a quarter or two ago and that you just need to work through, or, or how should we think about that? Yeah, we saw a slowdown in Europe. We did have one pretty large cancellation this quarter, actually, uh, that had to do with the digital offering. So it was um, – you remember we we acquired – um, IDMS a few years back, uh, and this was um, a pretty large bank in Europe that had, um, you know, a big digital offering there. So it was a legacy um, legacy product that we ended up losing, uh, which contributed to some of that slowdown. But I'd, I'd characterize that as more of a one-off. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Nicholas with William Blair. Your line is now open. Thanks. Good morning. Seems like there's been quite a bit of, of M&A in the portfolio management space, um, particularly of late. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could update us on how you're thinking about your product suite there, how it stacks up competitively, and, and whether there are any product gaps or opportunities that you'd like to address in the near to medium term, whether it's organically or via M&A. So the question is around consolidation within the asset management space, just to clarify. Yeah, that and, and just the, the portfolio management kind of uh, technology space as well and, and how that kind of if – other, if other players are kind of moving up the chain or, or adding pieces to their suite, if that's changed, how, how your offering stacks up competitively. Yeah, good question. So, you know, consolidation obviously has been going on for a long time in our end markets. And uh, I've mentioned this on previous calls, but we are having more and more exciting uh, conversations with our asset management clients uh, at the C-level. So very often now we'll be talking to CTOs, CIOs about FactSet's overall offering from uh, research all the way through to client reporting. Uh, and as these firms are consolidating, um, the equation for them uh, gets more and more complicated in terms of how do they rationalize their spend across a large number of vendors, uh, and how do they uh, make sense out of that technology stack, and how they are managing their own data uh, throughout their workflows. So we are so well positioned for these conversations now, given the offerings we have all the way across the portfolio lifecycle and the integration that we've done and our move to the cloud. So when we sit down with our clients now and talk about the trends in the marketplace that they're dealing with, uh, which in some ways are the same trends we're dealing with as a technology company, we're having really good conversations about how we can help them. So there's a big push, I believe, within the asset management space uh, for these larger asset managers, particularly that are stitching together uh, different um, entities uh, to really simplify their lives, which means simplify the number of technology providers they deal with and simplify the number of data providers they deal with. So uh, we're running towards those conversations, and, you know, these are, these are longer-term efforts with our clients, but I'm very encouraged by the level of conversations that our sales and technology teams are having uh, with clients um, on the buy side. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I think the second... The second yeah, the second part of your sure. question is, you know, the, the, these larger asset managers really only want to deal with sort of one or maybe two uh, major um, partners to build their ecosystem around. And there's a pretty short list, frankly, of firms that are able to do that for, for, for them. And Faxit is, is one of the firms on that short list. So, uh, you know, th there's some consolidation. There are other people kind of moving into the space, as you mentioned, uh, but in terms of firms that have uh, the number of workflows and, and, and a critical mass of content for the clients, uh, that's a pretty short list. And maybe yeah, I can that's, just that's add helpful. Yeah, I mean, sure. When we talk about adding on capabilities, you can do that uh, via the acquisition of, I think, what you're saying, more of a, a technology type of, of asset. But often the assets that we have seen even with True Value come with their own, well, it's more content or feeds. Is they actually have a lot of their own proprietary capabilities, which adds quite a lot to us as well. So I wouldn't look at purely technology capabilities as having to be obtained purely from technology acquisitions. Got it. Got it. That's uh, all very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then for my follow-up, and I, variations of this question have, have been asked, and you, you've answered some of them. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, you announced the three-year investment program in, in 2019. Obviously, a lot has, has happened since then. But I'm wondering, given what seems like a, a bit more stable sales environment, um, how you're thinking about that high single-digit ASV growth target. I know it was originally, you know, estimated to be 2022, but – um, how has that timeline evolved or changed, and, and how are you thinking about that over the next couple of years? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, t I'll take that one. Um, I mean, right now we've been uh, catching up. The world has changed, and, but we are on plan, as, as you noted. 
in terms of the hiring and, and development milestones uh, as we expected for this fiscal year. And our focus right now is executing and, uh, and determining any changes that will adapt to uh, in the macro environment uh, as we think about you know, next year. We're committed to our multi-year plan. Um, and, uh, when, and as I said from the beginning, we're really um, reaffirmed in some sense uh, on, our, on our strategy. But the environments you know, continue to be uncertain, so we're taking a continued measured uh, approach. And our goal is, is to get to what we talked about, a longer-term uh, growth rate. Uh, and the timing of May may have shifted, but once we've got better visibility on our progress uh, and the market, then we'll be able to provide uh, you know, greater clarity and an update. But, uh, but for now, we're very pleased with where we stand as we look to where we are in uh, FY21. Got it. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ashish Sabadra with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Congrats on the RBC win. Just a quick clarification on the RBC. Is all of the RBC ASP included in the second quarter 21, or is there anything more coming uh, in the out quarters? Thanks. I, um, Helen, do you have the details on that? I believe it may be spread out over a couple of quarters, as are the users. Yeah, no, yeah, I think that's so some of it was in um, in Q, Q1, some in Q, but most of it now is in, so I wouldn't necessarily look towards that as a, a material change in the back half of the year. Okay, that's very helpful, Color. Uh, and then just on the pricing increases, this time it was $2 million more, um, 14 million of pricing increases from Americas, if I've got that right. I uh, just yep. wanted to better understand uh, what's driving that higher price increases. Um, uh, Phil, you mentioned the deep sector strategy driving a lot of sales. Is that also driving better prices? And if that's the case, just any col incremental color on the deep sector strategy, uh, where are you in the process of uh, fully building it out and uh, which sectors have been built out and which are, are still in progress? Thanks. I think generally on the price increase, and Helen, chime in uh, if you've got more color here. I think it was just very good execution with this, within this environment and clients recognizing uh, the value within uh, the facts of product. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Oh, sorry. The second part was just on the deep sector. Uh, you mm -hmm. talked about the, that driving pretty good sales. So my question there was on the deep sector. Uh, if you could just provide us an update on um, yeah. which verticals uh, have, yeah, oh, details yeah. on that front. Thanks. Yeah. So we've done work on financials, insurance, and real estate. Those are the three that we're talking about now. But as part of our three-year plan, we did. We are um, actively. Uh, have plans to, to do more than those three sectors. That's and very helpful, Colette. Yeah, as a related Sorry, go ahead, to go ahead. price increase, I think that's uh, tells exactly right. We have spent a lot, and, and it's part of our core culture, of focusing on uh, enhancements and making the service as best we can for the client. And I think during, if anything, during this period, um, during the pandemic, that uh, that has really come through, really shown through with clients, and, and it resonates. So I don't want to say that exactly, therefore, <laughs> drives the pri higher prices, but it does mean, it does reaffirm the value that we're bringing to them. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The, thank you. Our next question comes from George Tong with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Wanted to dive deeper into the ASV growth guidance for the full year. At the midpoint, the ASV guide was increased by seven and a half million. So to what extent was that increase attributable to the new RBC contract versus other factors? Hey, George, it's Phil. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a lot more than the RBC win. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the confidence that we have in our research products and the performance that we're seeing there is very encouraging because the, the core workstation and web offering uh, can be sold to all different client types. And when you see, um, you know, the number of net new clients uh, that we added this quarter, even though they were uh, on the smaller side for the net new business, um, it was a really healthy mix across asset managers, hedge funds, asset owners, uh, private equity, corporates, 
So uh, pretty much across the board, we're adding new names, uh, which I think is a great indication of the strength there. And then you're seeing it, um, as already described, you know, within the existing clients in terms of, um, you know, just uh, adding more seats. And, and, you know, when we've got a seat, we're able to cross-sell uh, more of our analytics products. We're, we're able to go in and sell CTS. So I would say that is the main uh, thing that's driving the optimism there on the, on the uh, for you. And George, I would, I would add to that. When we started off back in September providing our guidance, it obviously was, was wide with given the uncertainty. And so what we wanted to see and what's come through, which gives us a better perspective for the back half of the year, is the fact that our retention has, retained, has, has remained stable. Um, new business, which one didn't know how that was going to uh, come through um, in FY21, uh, has also been in line with the past quarters. And what's really been um, a driver is, is the expansion. So we are selling more to existing clients. And I think that just helps us feel better, certainly around the, the uh, lower half of that range, and that's why we moved it up. So it's not attributable to a deal, but rather the momentum we're seeing across uh, the way we're executing. Got it. That's helpful. Your uh, net client count increased by 164 uh, over the past three months, primarily driven by an increase in wealth management and corporate clients. Can you discuss how net client count is performing among buy side clients? Yeah, so I think I just mentioned that. So we added a number of new names, uh, you know, in institutional asset managers, uh, asset owners, and hedge funds, which is um, most most of the firms that we have on the buy side. Got it. So just, just to clarify, on a net basis, buy side clients went up in the quarter. Correct. Yes, they definitely did. Yep. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from Keith Hallison with North Coast Research. Your line is now open. Good morning, guys. Question for you regarding the, the remainder of the year and how you guys are kind of thinking about bringing employees back and perhaps re returning more to a life of normalcy, assuming we're you know, heading that direction now. Obviously, just trying to think about how expenses are going to unfold through the rest of the year. Yeah, that's a great question. So we just had a couple of uh, really good calls with our leadership team globally to talk about that. There's still a lot of factors out there, uh, but we're optimistic, uh, particularly in the U.S., that we can begin to reopen offices on a phased basis starting in June. So we, like many companies, will step our way in and uh, make sure that we're doing things correctly. So we certainly won't be going back to 100%, uh, I believe, until sometime towards the end of this fiscal year or early next year in terms of the Americas. And even when we do that, I think we're going to be working in a hybrid environment. So a lot of employees have benefited from the balance, uh, both from a work and life, you know, life standpoint. So we're, like every company, are trying to make sure that we figure out what that, that balance is best for everybody. Um, other countries that we operate in, you know, vaccines are less readily available. Uh, but, you know, we're, I, I'm sure over the next 12 months, uh, we're going to be in a really good position. So um, I think the short answer is you'll begin to see us head back into the offices in locations where vaccines are readily available in the beginning of June, uh, and it'll just ramp up from there. Okay. And, and then switching over to the sales side, it, obviously it's been a challenge as everybody's adjusted their sales structure into the virtual world. Have you seen any pent-up demand, though, or expectations of pent-up demand for when things do get a bit more back to normal, just because some things weren't able to be done virtually? Um, or do you think everybody's converted over and is pretty much, you know, sales expectations should be more as we've seen them? I, for the um, larger, more complicated enterprise deals, uh, being face-to-face -face for, um, you know, some of that sales cycle as well as the impl implementation, uh, will have some degree of importance. But on the, uh, I think for the smaller deals that are more easily done virtually, we've learned a lot there. Uh, but there, I think there is, there, there, will, there should be some pent up demand of some sort, I think, for the uh, larger, uh, more complicated deals that we have out there. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. This concludes today's question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Phil Snow for closing remarks. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to speaking to you next quarter. And in the meantime, please call Rima Haider with additional questions. Operator, that ends today's call.
This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may not disconnect.